Today's video is brought to you by CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of fascinating documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. No reality show nonsense here, just non-fiction entertainment enjoyed by millions. CuriosityStream is available on many platforms, web app, Android, Roku, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kittle, and Apple TV. So pretty much everywhere. It's also available worldwide, which is nice. Look, if you like this channel, and imagine you might since you're watching it right now, hello there. Head on over to CuriosityStream and check out their docu-series, History by the Numbers. It's really interesting. It talks about some of the places that we've talked about here on Geographics, as well as some others that we've covered on Biographics as well, this channel's sister channel. It's, uh, look, if you like this, you'll like that. Go to CuriosityStream.com slash Geographics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And right now, you guys can use the promo code GEOGRAPHICS and you'll save 25% off the cost of an annual subscription, which comes out to only $14.99 a year. Not a month, which is what you might expect, but $14.99 a year. It's crazy cheap, so click the link below, go to curiositystream.com slash geographics and get 25% off. And now, today's video. It's the evening of August 21st, 1986. The crystal blue waters of a picturesque lake in Central Africa placidly reflects the light of a half moon. As the nocturnal birds sing their early songs, weary farmers and cattle herders prepare for a night of rest. By the morning of August 22nd, the waters of the lake had turned red. The birds had fallen silent, and across the villages surrounding the lake, more than 1,700 people lay dead. Something had happened during the night. Something bad. Some will say it's a nuclear accident, some will blame an ancient spirit, but it was down to science to find an answer. This is the story of the event that took place at Lake Nars in Cameroon, and how a team of scientists ensured that it would never happen again. Lake Nars is located in Cameroon, central western Africa, more precisely in the Grassfields region, about 322 kilometers northwest of the capital city, Yaoundé. The lake is about 1.9 kilometers long, 1.2 kilometers wide. On its southwestern end, Nars is rather shallow, but it drops off steeply to a depth of 208 meters. In geographical terms, it is defined as a ma, or a lake of volcanic origin. Originally, it was a crater formed by a violent steam explosion. It gradually filled with water over the centuries, with a warm, superficial layer acting like a cap, covering cooler waters underneath. Nars is one of some 13 Mars present in this region, and just like other lakes, it always had a special place in the folklore and legends of Cameroon. These expanses of water are said to be the residence of dead ancestors and mythical spirits. These entities are rarely a force for good, and lakes are portrayed as a source of death. According to lore collected by anthropologist Eugenia Shanklin of Trenton State College, New Jersey, spirits may cause a lake to rise, sink, change location, or even explode. Surface springs surrounding the lake are also permeated with tales of death. Frogs, birds, and other animals approaching them were doomed to drop dead. Local mythology is very specific about Nars, and its shores have been considered taboo for human habitation for a long time. According to an ancient tale, a group of men had decided to cross Lake Nars. Their leader had parted the waters Moses-style. As they walked on the dry bottom of the lake, a mosquito bit the testicle of the superpowered man. He swatted the insect away, but in doing so, he lost his concentration and the waters came rushing back. Everyone in the crossing party drowned, and their village of the dead could still be glimpsed underneath the clear surface. Over time, the warning power carried by these tales may have waned as human communities began to settle around the lake. The first settlers to inhabit the area belonged to the Bathman ethnic group. However, they took great care not to settle too close to the shores. According to their traditions, they built their houses on the high grounds, founding the village of Upper Niles. In the mid-20th century, other groups moved to the area, but they did not follow the previously established customs. The Fulani group, for example, settled near the shore, establishing the village of Lower Nars. By the early 1980s, population expanded around Lower Nars, quickly approaching the 10,000 inhabitants mark. Even some of the cautious Bathmen joined in. Most of these stories may have been forgotten by the mid-1980s, but the event that took place on August 21, 1986, would inevitably bring them back to the surface.
August the 21st, 1986, had been a market day in the village of Lower Nass, an opportunity to trade goods and have a good time on the shores of the crystal clear lake. That evening, most residents went to bed early. Little did they know that while they were falling asleep, the world, or at least their world, was about to end. The next morning, silence had fallen like a shroud on the once thriving community. Overnight, 1,788 men, women, and children had fallen dead, mostly in the villages of Lower Nass and Char. About 8,300 cows, goats, and other domestic animals had also died, a catastrophic blow to the community of farmers and herders. Of the 4,000 survivors, 3,000 had lost their livelihood and needed to be resettled. So what had happened? Well, let's rewind our clocks to the evening of the 21st. At about 9 p.m., Efrian Che, a farmer in Upper Nas, was taking in the views of the lake. He was startled by a rumbling noise, like rocks sliding from crater walls surrounding the mar. He then noticed a white mist rising from the waters and was beset by a feeling of unease. Feeling ill, he bid goodnight to his children and went to bed. Around the same time, Halami Suli, a cowherd in Lower Nas, heard the same rumbling noise. It sounded like many voices shouting at once. Then a roaring wind swept through her family compound and she immediately lost consciousness. The morning after, Ephraim Che woke up early and walked downhill. There was something strange in the air. It was silence, utter and crushing. No morning chorus of birds, no incessant buzzing of insects. The lake looked different. Normally a crystal blue, it was now a dull red, and its surface was littered with floating vegetation. It appeared as though large waves had surged from the lake, tearing down trees by the southern shore. He hastened his pace towards the shore when he heard Halima shrieking in despair. Ephraim, come here. Why are these people lying here? Why won't they move again? That's when he saw them. 35 bodies scattered around Halima's farm. Her children and all her extended family lay dead. Jay ran into Lower Nas looking for his own relatives. They were all gone. Sumped on the ground, caught by a mysterious and sudden demise while getting ready for bed. Nearly all of the villagers, a thousand inhabitants, had died. Some had merely lost consciousness, but they had woken up after several hours, realized what had happened to their loved ones, and committed suicide. In the nearby village of Charp, one of the few survivors was a baby. He was found, happily gurgling away, oblivious to the apocalypse, still held in his dead mother's arms. The event had not spared Subum, 10 kilometers east of Nas. On the evening of the 21st, a man heard his daughter choking in a room nearby. As he went to see what was wrong, he collapsed to the floor. The morning after, he woke up with a burning sensation in his lungs. Weakened, he dragged himself to his daughter's bedroom, but she'd never wake up again. The distraught father climbed on his motorbike and headed to Wum, 54 kilometers westward, to check on his extended family. All around him, the houses, farms, and vehicles appeared intact, but the roads were littered with the bloated corpses of people and animals. When he reached Wum, he realized that the town had been unaffected and no one had even yet learned of the event. He was admitted to a hospital where he tried to explain what had happened, but realized he could not talk. His lungs would simply not work. When he could finally speak, authorities decided to investigate. A contingent of police and medical staff drove to the Nars area, but when they encountered the first corpses, they stopped. What if whatever had killed these unfortunate souls was still a present danger? Amongst the rescue party, only one individual dared enter the area, Father Ten Horn, a Dutch priest. He drove his truck through Chard, then Lower Nars amidst a complete lack of sound. Life had been drained from the region, all he could see were cadavers on the ground. Finally, in Subum, he came across some survivors, but they had difficulty in speaking, and in any case, no one could explain what calamity had struck their village. The dead would soon start decomposing under the sun, but survivors wanted to wait for the gendarmerie before burying them. Tenhon overruled them, wary of the dangers of an epidemic. He instructed the villagers to start digging mass graves. He then loaded some of the survivors onto his truck and delivered them to a hospital, later returning for a second load. Finally, officials stepped in, sending relief workers via helicopter or even commandeered beer trucks. The medical teams who first entered to the villages, both dead and alive, realized that they'd suffered from some form of quick yet painful suffocation. When interviewed by Time International at a later stage, the Dutch priest commented that it was as though a neutron bomb had gone off. Father Tenhorn's remark proved to be rather unfortunate. In second-hand retellings of his interview, the as-though bit was dropped. The rumor that a neutron bomb had been detonated at Lake Nars gradually gained pace. A neutron bomb, or small hydrogen bomb, differs from standard nukes, as its primary lethal effects do not derive from the blast, but from the radiation caused by the neutrons that it emits. Thus, it could possibly deal little damage to houses and infrastructure while causing life forms to die within a well-defined perimeter. Conspiracy theorists piled onto the rumor, adding dubious details to substantiate their story. At the time of the tragedy, Israeli Prime Minister Shimon Peres was 
on an official visit in Yaoundé, and Israel had been one of the first countries to offer international aid to the local government. Too quickly, perhaps. Let's add another curious incident. In the days before the event, locals had noticed some strange motorcyclists around Lake Nass. They were described as being of European or North American origin and looking suspicious, even threatening. One of them carried a bulky parcel on the back of his bike. Could that package have been a neutron bomb? Well, in theory, yes, neutron bombs were designed in the late 1970s to be fitted onto NATO artillery shells. But in practice, going to say no. It later emerged that those bikers were members of the Peace Corps. However, if a conspiratorial mind puts two and two together, it would always get 666 inside an Illuminati triangle. The resulting theory was that the USA and Israel had jointly developed a new kind of neutron bomb. They had selected Lake Nass to test it and to dispatch those bikers to plant the device. But why Lake Nass of all places? And that's because, well, maybe reasons? The flurry of theories and explanations that mushroomed after the event sparked the interest of anthropologists. One of the first to reach the area was Professor Paul Nkui at University of Yaoundé. When questioning survivors amongst the Muslim Fulani community, some of them explained the catastrophe as a manifestation of Allah's will. According to Nkui, they believed the death of almost 1,800 people was God's way of teaching a lesson. Although they couldn't explain exactly what lesson nor why that community deserved such a punishment. The Bathmen and other ethnic groups clung on to traditional law which perceived lakes as harbingers of malevolent entities. Professor Nukui collected several stories about Mami Wata, a siren-like spirit who inhabits the waters, bringing death and destruction when she emerges. Curiously, the Mami Wata myth originated in southeastern Nigeria. There, she is associated with healing powers and seduction. It was only in Cameroon that she became a destructive force, but even then, she was held responsible for creating strong currents that kill swimmers in the ocean. So the association of Mami Wata with a lake disaster appeared gratuitous at best, and Professor Nkui recorded how this supernatural explanation quickly fizzled out. But Cameroonian law about the dangers of lakes should not be discounted. Remember how the Bathman had settled on the high ground above the lake? How they had founded up and Nass? Well, they had done so according to their tradition. Apparently based on myth, it was still actually some pretty good practical advice. And when the truth emerged about the event, it became clear how that advice had saved the lives of the inhabitants of up and Nass. To explain what had really happened at Lake Nass, we have to jump backwards in time. On August 15, 1984, a similar event took place around another Cameroonian lake, the Manaun at Ma, located some 96 kilometers south of Nars. The consequences were less devastating, claiming 37 lives. The disaster piqued the interest of the U.S. Embassy in Yaoundé, who called to investigate Harold R. Sigurdsson, professor of volcanology at the University of Rhode Island. Sigurdsson suspected that a volcanic eruption had released noxious gases responsible for the loss of life, but his analysis proved negative, as he found none of the telltale signs he had expected, such as presence of sulfur in the lake. But he did find a high concentration of carbon dioxide. And at that moment, a light bulb went off. This was his conclusion. For centuries, magma degassing at the bottom of Manaun Lake had released great quantities of carbon dioxide dissolving into the water. This pent-up gas had eventually exploded in an event that he called a limnic eruption, after the Greek word for lake, limni. A giant cloud of carbon dioxide had popped out of the surface, sweeping the surrounding areas. This gas is 1.5 times denser than air, thus the killer could have displaced the normal, breathable atmosphere, causing all humans and animals within its reach to die of asphyxiation. Sigurdsson submitted his findings to the Journal of Science just some months before the disaster at Neos. Alas, his paper was rejected as being too far-fetched, and only a handful of geologists and volcanologists were aware of the limnic eruption hypothesis. In the months following the August 1986 catastrophe, European, Japanese, and U.S. volcanologists, geologists, and chemists converged onto Lake Neos to find a solution. Early findings from volcanologists confirmed that an underwater volcanic eruption was not the answer. George Kling, a limnologist or lake expert from the University of Michigan, proceeded to collect samples from the bottom of the mar. He noted that these started effervescing when reaching the surface, an indicator of carbon dioxide being dissolved into the waters. Over the ensuing weeks, Kling and other experts formulated a solution to the puzzle. Lake Nass rests above a pile of rocks and ash left over from ancient volcanic blasts. This rubble had trapped large deposits of carbon dioxide, which subterranean springs are then carried into the waters at the bottom of the lake. The warm waters in the topmost layers of the mar had acted as a seal, keeping the gas bottled underneath. Pressure kept on building, and the giant bubble was waiting to burst at any time. It just needed 
a trigger. If you remember, on the night of August the 21st, Mr. Che and other survivors reported hearing a rumbling noise. Geologists later noted that a cliff overlooking Nars showed signs of a rock slide. Perhaps it was that, an avalanche of boulders suddenly crashing into the surface of the lake, which caused the fragile balance to snap, releasing a cloud of pressurized death. The resulting eruption released 1.6 million tons of carbon dioxide. As the gas spouted out of the surface, it created a crashing wave, devastating trees near the lake's shores. The limnic eruption had also stirred iron-rich water from the lake's bottom. The iron oxidized when it reached the surface, turning the once crystal blue waters into a blood-red pool. In the meantime, a carbon dioxide cloud some 49 meters thick quickly moved downhill, traveling at 72 kilometers an hour and covering a distance of 24 kilometers from the shores. It first appeared as a mist, then it was perceived as a strong gust of wind, an almost imperceptible hand which choked the song out of birds, and later laughter and life from infants and their parents. Upper Nars and other settlements on the high ground were spared the ordeal as carbon dioxide is too heavy to travel uphill. Those communities had followed the ancient traditions and they'd survived. Perhaps those myths of spirits and drowned villagers were cautionary tales spun by the elders who had memories of similar events, almost lost in the mist of centuries. So science has solved the mystery of Cameroon's killer lakes, but a question still lingered on. Could a similar disaster happen again? George Kling and Professor of Biochemistry W.C. Evans at the University College of North Wales returned to Nars and Manown in early 1987 to analyze the waters. Their tests showed the limnic eruptions had not completely cleared the carbon dioxide deposits. What was worse, the killer gas was accumulating again. They worked out a series of potential solutions. For example, dropping depth bombs into the lakes, dumping lime to neutralize the gas, or draining it via tunnels in the lake beds. But all these ideas were either too dangerous or too expensive. The final proposal was the real deal. Why not run a pipe from the deepest water layer up to the surface? It could gradually release carbon dioxide and disperse it without harm. Michael Halbach, an engineer from the University of Savoy in France, got the contract to design and install the necessary equipment. Gathering investment from the European Union and private donors, Harwax was able to test different types of pipes from 1990 to 1995. Initially, they were not much different than standard garden hoses, but the engineer tested progressively larger pipes until he found the sweet spot of 14 centimeters. Harwax and his co-workers barely had time to high-five each other when the money ran out, and the Cameroonian government couldn't afford the project. King and Evans stepped in, lobbying governments, NGOs, and even oil companies racing against time. Finally, in 1999, the U.S. Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance wrote a check for $433,000, which allowed for a pipe to be permanently installed at NAS. By January 2001, it was ready. Harwax was on site, his finger on a remote control, ready to activate the degassing procedure that would drain the lethal bubble of carbon dioxide. There was a chance that the process could activate a sudden, uncontrolled cloud of gas, so the Cameroonian army had provided emergency oxygen tanks. But when the French engineer pushed the button, Everything went as planned. A spray of water and gas shot upwards at 160 km an hour. A controlled and harmless geezer signaled that the nightmare was over. The families that had been displaced by the tragedy gradually repopulated the heights around Nars. In 2003, a similar pipe was installed at Manown. After the initial optimism, however, Harbwerks and his team were worried. The degassing worked fine, but it was too slow, especially at Lake Nars. 5,500 tons of carbon dioxide poured into the bottom of the lake every year, a rate far too fast for a single extraction pipe. The project had to be expanded, but the problem was the same. Funding. Luckily, this story has a happy ending. In 2010, the United Nations Development Programme, or UNDP, in cooperation with the Cameroonian government and the EU, secured funding to install two more pipes at NAS. The project involved building a network of shelters and secure gathering points, as well as evacuation drills for the locals. Furthermore, in March 2011, the UNDP had also installed a solar-powered alarm to immediately detect dangerous carbon dioxide leaks. In 2012, Kling and Evans returned to Cameroon to assess the degassing project. They were elated to find out that the levels of gas in Manown were negligible, that Lake NAS carbon dioxide Oxide concentrations had decreased by 40% since 2001 and were still plummeting. Until the mid-1980s, limnic eruptions had been an unknown phenomenon, only vaguely hinted at by ancient lore. Science had stepped in, analyzed, described, and neutralized this lurking threat in Cameroon. Besides the Nars and the Manown, there were two more known volcanic lakes in the world that have high concentrations of carbon dioxide. One of them is Lake Albano, some 25 kilometers south of Rome, Italy. In 398 BC, the waters of the lake spilled unexpectedly, bringing about death and devastation in the surrounding countryside. The spillage may have been caused by the sudden release of a carbon dioxide bubble. 
But the Romans attributed the disaster to the ire of Neptune, god of the sea, and placated his wrath with ritual sacrifices. Four years later, to be on the safe side, they dug a drainage tunnel, still operational, which lowered the level of Lake Albano. The second lake at risk of a catastrophic event is Lake Kivu, on the border between Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here, the level of danger is much, much higher. The waters of this lake hold 2.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide, as well as large reserves of methane. The area is frequently struck by volcanic eruptions and earthquakes. Moreover, methane is extracted to produce electricity, but the methods used may destabilize the chemical balance of the waters. As a result of these factors, Kivu may be the site of a limnic eruption that could cause the asphyxiation and displacement of up to 2 million people. According to Canadian engineer Philip Morkel, such an event may be one of the worst, if not the worst, natural humanitarian disasters in history. Morkel is the founder of Hydrogas Energy, a company currently attempting to secure funding to degas Lake Kivu. The funding goals are far from being achieved, but Lake Kivu seems stable for the moment. But what Lake Nas has taught us is that tragedy can be unleashed unexpectedly. Sometimes it just takes some boulders rolling into the placid, moonlit surface of a lake. If we ever feature Lake Kivu in a future episode, I sincerely hope it will not be to describe a disaster, but to celebrate another successful degassing project.